Edward, you may begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Edward Alvarez, and I'm a second year student in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program online here at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. I would like to start off by welcoming our esteemed lead administrators. I would, always like, I would also like to welcome faculty from the Chicago School and our sister universities and the entire TCSPP student community. In tonight's presentation, Spotlighting Innovation Collaboration CMHC Online Showcase, you will be guided to different virtual rooms in our program, which will each have a faculty member and a student highlighting the innovation and collaboration efforts that make the CMHC online program truly unique. We will begin our showcase with a brief history of our program from Dr. Lori Ann Stretch, Professor, Program Director, and Department Chair of the CMHC program online. You will then be guided to four different rooms, each discussing a different component of our program. Room one will be student relationships with your guides, Dr. Christy Eldridge and Haley Penny, spring 2015 cohort. Room two will be skills development with your guides, Dr. Lori Soley and Cherish Beecham, fall 2014 cohort. Room three is creating a culture of community with your guides, Dr. Danita Hudson and Kirby Christian, fall 2014 cohort. And Dr. Lori Ann Stretch will join you again with Melissa Seitz, spring 2015 cohort, and student ambassador in room four for collaboration efforts. At the end of this showcase, Dr. Stretch and our entire panel of presenters will well return for a question and answer session. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge the work of Josira Glover, spring 2015 cohort, and student ambassador who could not be with us this evening. I would also like to bring your attention to the student highlight stars that you will see throughout this presentation. This will be an opportunity for our student presenters to offer insight on the impact the program has had on them. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Lori Ann Stretch, Professor, Program Director, and Department Chair of the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program online. Thank you, Edward. I'm so glad to be here tonight, and I really appreciate everybody's attendance. I know it's late in the day, and we are just so excited to share with you some of the innovations and the ways that we're using collaboration in our program. The CMHC program online started um, really well before any students ever hit the ground um, or joined the program, and I would like to really call out one individual on this call, Dr. Barbara Kelly, who really led the way in making sure that this program became a reality. She put in countless hours along with others um, who were also on this call to help make CMHC a reality. Um, she was on the hiring committee that actually hired me after the program received regional accreditation in April of 2014. And for that, Barb, I'm ever so thankful that you believed in me and gave me the opportunity to um, join TCS and be part of this program. Um, after coming on as the program director, I uh, was tasked with the a large task, actually, to review all the clinical counseling laws across the country. And I completed that review, and we made some minor modifications to the program and welcomed our first cohort in September of 2014, along with Christy Eldridge and Lori Soley as our first two faculty members, and Kelly Bilstrom as our part-time department manager. Without those individuals, this program could not possibly be a reality. And so I just want to thank them and acknowledge them for all the wonderful work they've done. We started out with a 21-student cohort in fall of 2014, and we've had some changes along the way, but we are now 74 students strong. Uh, we have uh, such a wonderful community, and I hope that you'll get a sense of that as you hear about what's going on in the program and the impact it's having on our students. If at any point tonight you have questions, I know all of you are muted. If you'd like to post a question, I'm happy to um, keep track of those, and I'll make sure that we answer them at the end. You can also raise your hand, and I will call on you at the end and unmute you and, and let you ask the questions. We do want this to be a, a dialogue near the end of the presentation. So, Edward, I will turn it back over to you now for your student highlights. 
Thank you, Dr. Stretch. So for uh, my student highlight, um, choosing the Chicago School and the CMHC program online has actually be one, been one of the best decisions that I've really ever made. Uh, the part of my training that has made the most impact on me has been the self-awareness, self-acceptance component that is really interwoven throughout this entire program. You know, as a gay Latin male, I've struggled with self-acceptance in my life, but throughout my time here, I've been challenged to take a look at all the different aspects of myself without judgment and begin to integrate them into my counselor identity. All of the professors here have really helped me to understand that those parts of me that I may want to hide from the world or even from myself can sometimes be the greatest tools in helping my future clients. We take our humanness with us into the counseling relationship, and so we're not trained to be some sort of counseling robot with a set of pre-learned responses, and it is that that I have been the most grateful to learn. So I'm forever grateful to this program. So now we will continue along with our presentation, and at this moment, we will be moving to room one, and at this time, I would like to introduce to everybody Haley Penny, from the spring 2015 cohort. Haley? Hi all, my name is Haley Penny. I'm part of the spring 2015 cohort and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Christy Eldridge. Dr. Eldridge is one of our core faculty and she has been part of the program since the very beginning. She is also our academic development plan manager. I'll turn it over to her to say a word about herself now. Hi everyone, it's uh, Dr. Christy Eldridge and I'm uh, happy to see very uh, familiar names on the call, so welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, Haley and I are very pleased to introduce you to the CMHC Advising Procedures, Advising Forum, and Student Engagement Projects. We'll first start with our advising procedures. Advising sessions are a crucial part of the process here at the Chicago School. They allow students to connect with a faculty advisor at various points throughout the program in order to answer questions, provide guidance, and help students feel comfortable with their journey. Each student is assigned a faculty member from whom they can receive guidance throughout the program. This helps each student feel cared about in a genuine way. So one of the primary values in our program is our student focus. We try to demonstrate this even before a student starts their first day of their first class uh, by reaching out to them in a variety of ways. First, the student receives a letter from Dr. Stretch, followed directly by an email and invitation to an initial advising session from their designated faculty advisor. And our goal is to hold these initial sessions in the week prior to or during the first week of the student's first term. Um, this is to help the student feel welcomed into a community, form a relationship with their advisor, share the expectations of, that the faculty have of the student, and address any initial concerns or questions. Um, to make sure faculty advisors are providing tailored guidance to students based on their stage in the program, we've designed a faculty advising manual that includes the suggested topics to be covered in the advising session depending upon which term of the program the student is in. For example, uh, an advising session, session for a student in one cohort may be focused on creating the student's professional development plan, uh, which is a complete plan of the student's coursework, possible fieldwork sites, desired specializations, and more while a student further along in the program may have an advising session focused on preparing for residency. So the manual provides the faculty advisor with suggested meeting agendas and templates for email invitations to the respective advising sessions. And also for students who may be struggling to meet the expectations of the program, we utilize the academic development plan program from the school to tailor student-specific resourcing plans hoping to give the student the best chance of addressing and overcoming those challenges. Advising at the Chicago School focuses on much more than academics and can include personal issues, helping a student overcome a challenge or difficulty, either during a specific course or over the course of the program. But perhaps most importantly, advising helps the student work towards their specific set of goals in a timely manner. Advising is always met with open arms and is available at any time. The benefits of this are far-reaching, as we all know that certain events can happen at a moment's notice. 
consider the death of a family member, an illness, or the addition of a new family member. All must be dealt with at the time. Thankfully, the faculty advisors take their positions very seriously and generously offer guidance and support whenever required. Uh, now we'd like to introduce you to the CMHB Advising Forum, which you see up on the screen here. Um, using a Canvas course room, we've set up an online student lounge where students can go to connect with one another and find resources to assist them through the program. A faculty contribute to this by regularly posting various learning resources, including APA formatting tips, group work etiquette, time management tips, self-care strategies, and, and so on, and using the announcements, modules, and discussion forms of Canvas, departmental resources are also available, including book lists for all courses, uh, pre-course modules, which are a glimpse at the first module of each course, the CMHC orientation presentation, residency orientation and updates, and information about professional conferences. Access to materials like the advising forum is crucial to success in so many ways. As an international student, knowing which books I need allows me to order them and be certain that they will arrive in time for class. Shipping internationally can sometimes be tricky, so I am thankful I can look ahead and order books with plenty of lead time. The pre-course modules are another invaluable tool provided by faculty for students. It allows you to get a glimpse of what is to come. To be more specific, what the workload might look like, what types of projects, papers, and assignments you will have, and if there will be group work. I find this allows me to sketch out a schedule and plan my seven weeks, as well as get a jump on any reading or making sure I am clear on what is required of me for the large signature assignment. Access to the pre-course modules is a wonderful tool I have never had before, but I'm so grateful for now. And finally, we'd like to highlight one of our successful student and faculty engagement efforts, which is our departmental newsletter. And from our department's very first newsletter, we've utilized a team of students and faculty to identify relevant content, gather and create the material, and design and edit the layout. We make an effort to include a variety of topics in each newsletter, including student spotlights, introductions of new faculty, articles from TCS and CMHC leaders, updates on residency, fieldwork, conferences, uh, and so on and so on. It's, it's really our newsletter team's goal to use the publication as a demonstration of our department's collaborative and welcoming attitude and our commitment to developing our students into counseling professionals. So now I'd like to invite Haile to, to briefly share her student spotlight on this area. Uh, in September of 2015, my husband and I were delighted to find out that we were finally pregnant. A moment later, I realized that baby would impact so many aspects of my life, including my master's program here at the Chicago School. I quickly reached out to my faculty advisor filled with anxiety and concern about how I would juggle a new baby and a master's program. One long and a very helpful phone call later, we had worked out a plan of attack that let me take the time I needed to bond with baby, but also encouraged me to work through the program in a timely fashion so that I would finish in close range to the rest of my cohort. Not once did I feel pressured to do anything I didn't feel was right. Instead, I felt encouraged supported, and as though I had a whole team of people behind me acting as a cheerleading squad. I am forever grateful to my advising team for helping me figure out how to balance school and a new baby, all while helping me feel encouraged and supported. Thank you, Haley, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Eldridge and Haley. Next up, we will be going to room two which will be our skills development room. And at this moment, I would like to introduce Cherish Beecham Fall 2014 cohort. Thank you, Edward. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the skills development room. My name is Cherish Beecham, and I am from the Fall 2014 cohort. Dr. Lori Soley and I will be your navigators for this room, and I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Soley to get us started. Thank you, Cherish, and welcome, everyone. I was hired on as the APP for the CMHC online in the fall of 2014, 
and was immediately charged with developing a comprehensive longitudinal student assessment plan. Well, with the invaluable help from my GA, we did an extensive literature review, and sadly, no extant instrument was found which really measured the full range of clinical skills and dispositions our faculty believed important to assess and monitor over time. From that, the Dispositions and Skills Competency Assessment, or what we refer to as the DISCA, was born. Our DISCA is a three-part assessment grounded in and cross-referenced to the 2016 KCRIP standards, the ACA Code of Ethics, the 2015 Multicultural Counseling Competency, TCSPP's ILGs, and our program CLOs. Faculty continuously assess all students on the part one of the DISCA, which measures student professional behavior and disposition. Faculty data is then aggregated and analyzed at benchmark intervals throughout the program using TK20. Specifically used during clinical training courses, residencies, and field work, the DISCA parts two and three assess student basic and advanced professional practice skills and behaviors. One of the most important parts about the DISCA is that our students are informed about its use and process as early as their admissions interview, which really helps normalize the process, the use, and the functions, and demystifies what it's for. In fact, students self-assess and reflect upon their own and faculty DISCA results routinely throughout coursework. Using the DISCA data has really assisted faculty with the gatekeeping function necessary in counselor education. More importantly, however, it really promotes and informs programmatic data-driven assessment and decision-making. As a program, we are all very excited to continue to use and research and promote the DISCA. Cherish, from your perspective as a student, what has your experience with the DISCA been like? Thank you, Dr. Foley. As students, the DISCA is a tool that we can use to assess our own progress. It helps us determine where we believe our skills level to be and what areas may require more attention. It also allows us to compare our assessment of our skills to our professor's assessment and see in what areas they match up and in what areas they differ. In addition to monitoring our own progress, I think that the DISCA is a good tool to help facilitate discussion about self-efficacy and other things. For example, in using this tool, a professor might find that a particular student tends to constantly rate their skills and dispositions lower than what the professor is rating. As a result, the professor may want to find out why. Maybe the student is not confident in his or her skills or doesn't believe that they are using the skills effectively. I believe that these are things that the professor may want to know and address. Thanks, Cherish. That's really helpful. The next item on our topical agenda for the evening is the residency focus and process. Our CHMC residencies are unique and I believe incomparable in content and process amongst our competitors. Grounded in experiential learning for student engagement and self-reflection are paramount to the process. Theory merges with clinical practice during five what we call exhilarating and exhausting days of small and large group activities. Intensive skills practice, cultural awareness building, and a day of service learning are just a few of the curricular highlights during our residency week. Our residency mantra is trust the process, paralleling a vital counseling professional tenet. Throughout residencies, students and faculty alike actively integrate Don Miguel Ruiz's four agreements of being impeccable with our words, not making assumptions, not taking things personally, and doing our best. Our residency weeks are integrated into our helping relationships and group counseling courses, which allows for didactic pedagogy to align and then simultaneously blend with student clinical skill development. Cherish actually attended our first residency last summer, and I know she has some good perspectives to offer on this. Yes, I do. Residency helps us gain a deeper understanding of ourselves, not only professionally, but personally as well. We are taught that our culture and experiences affect the way we counsel, and that counselors are to be aware of those influences. Residency helps us develop the skills that we will need to be effective counselor, but it also helps us dig deep and reflect on the things that make us who we are as individuals and how those things influence the counseling process. 
the service learning project was also a major part of residency. We went out into different cultural communities and spent time with individuals whose culture we might not have been familiar with. This project promotes multicultural interactions and teaches us ways in which we can bridge cultural gaps in order to effectively communicate and build relationships. I'll give it back over to Dr. Soli to talk about our practice section. Thanks, Cherish. And actually, our clinical practice sessions emanated directly from the impact that the residency had on our students. During residency, we received feedback from students about how helpful it was being able to practice and receive skill feedback from their professors in real time. As a faculty, one of our key elements is consistently attempting to utilize and implement student ideas for program improvement when and wherever feasible. From the information that we got from students at residency, we actually launched monthly clinical skills practice sessions where students can attend a go-to meeting and engage with peers and faculty in counseling skills practice and feedback activities. Our faculty rotates facilitating the sessions, and while to date the turnout has been moderate, those attending have reported a great benefit. Cherish, I think you were maybe one of the initiators of this idea, and I'm curious, what are your thoughts as they have rolled out through the program? I, I did suggest it after residency, and um, I believe that these practice sessions allow us the opportunity to practice in a more informal environment, which can ease some of the pressure that we may feel when completing a session for a grade. Also, compared to practicing with other students alone or with friends and getting, getting feedback from them, these sessions allow instant feedback from experienced individuals in our profession who are knowledgeable about the skills that we are working to develop. Great, thanks. And just as an addendum, one of the things that we are implementing before our second residency for the students who have already attended our first residency is what we're calling our residency boot camp, where instead of monthly, we'll actually have weekly sessions where students can drop in and really polish their skills before they hit residency two and also before they start their field work. Speaking of field work, the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight is our field work management pilot. So our latest innovation that I will highlight is the design, integration, and pilot of our clinical training forum and field work management system within PK20. These new initiatives will potentially provide a very unique structure, flow, and data process for student faculty and, importantly, our nationwide field work site partners. This innovation is, in fact, so new that it hasn't even been rolled all the way out to students. Um, it is, in fact, in development as we speak. So when Cherish and I were tasked with this, she didn't even know what I was talking about when this bullet point showed up on her desktop. Right, Cherish? Right. Um, I wasn't, it has not been introduced to us formally, but I'm even so feel confident that this is something that will be beneficial for us as we transition into our practicum and internship phase of the program. Thanks, Cherish. I think one of the things that, that we've really tried to highlight it here is that all of our, our, our initiatives are very student-driven, and that includes our skills. So, Cherish, I wonder if you would just reflect on, just for a few minutes on your spotlight moment regarding our topic. Um, yes, mine is fitting that I had this room. My highlight comes from my residency experience, and it emphasizes you know, the relationship between students and faculty. Um, and I remember we had just finished a group activity and were getting ready to leave for the day. And this particular activity was emotionally heavy and intensive as we were exploring our unconscious biases and such. I was sitting in the hallway waiting for a friend, and I guess Dr. L.A., as her students lovingly call her, wanted to just check in. And she, she stopped by and asked me how I was doing. And I replied, you know, I'm, I'm okay. And she just looked at me for a few seconds and said, Cherish, are you really okay? And sat down next to me. And I kind of broke down after that and talked about a lot about how the activity impacted me. And she sat and talked with me for a while. And it was very cathartic. You know, right there in the public hallway, she created this safe place for me to just be. And I was fortunate to be able to experience how that felt as a client, and not only as a client, but as one of her students, to realize that the professors in this program genuinely care for your well-being and are so connected that they are sensitive to certain things about you. It's an amazing feeling. And it was also a learning experience because later on I was able to reflect on that experience 
from a professional standpoint, you know, her demeanor, her body language, her tone, and notice the effect that those things had on me as a client. And it's something that I've modeled and emulated in my own practice sessions as a counselor. Thank you, Cherish. Now I think we turn it back over to Edward. Thank you, Dr. Soli and Cherish. Now we will be going to room three, uh, creating a culture of community. And I'd like to introduce to you at this point, Kirby Christian, Fall 2014 cohort. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our room, creating a culture of community. Our newest and greatly appreciated faculty member, Dr. Danita Hudson, and I will speak about creating an atmosphere that nurtures teamwork, collaboration, and constant learning opportunities within our CMHC programs. Again, my name is Kirby Christian. I'm a part of the Fall 2014 cohort, and we welcome you. Dr. Hudson? Thank you, Kirby. In our room, we'll talk about uh, co-teaching and collaboration first. I'm so sorry. Well, that didn't work out. That didn't go too well, did it? I apologize, folks. Okay, well, I'm going to try to go on while my answering machine picks up that call. Basically, what I'd like to talk to you about is our co-teaching and collaboration model. First of all, in, in many of our classes, we have the opportunity to co-teach with other faculty. It provides the opportunity to divide workload evenly so that as we are managing large classes, we have support and we're receiving feedback from other faculty during that process. One of the strengths of this model is the multiple perspectives that students receive and that we receive as faculty. We have the time to talk about our diverse experiences and our multiple approaches to certain topics. We also have live discussions. As you will know in our, our meeting here, we um, believe that working with students in that format helps to provide a better learning environment. So what we do when we have co-teachers is that we can have up to four live discussions during the week, whereas if we're working by ourselves, we may only be allowed to have two. Also, grading comes in and as well as in multiple uh, perspectives. For instance, I might be very strong in APA style and be able to provide a lot of feedback in that area to students, while other faculty may pick up on some of those nuances that I might have not, and they can then provide feedback in that area. Next, another strong point to co-teaching is the announcements and ask the instructors area. Normally, in a classroom, we receive two days off, and there's two days during the week where those areas of the classroom are not monitored. Using the co-teaching model, we're able to monitor announcements and ask the instructors on a daily basis. All students receive responses quicker and are able to then, uh, if there's some challenges that they're receiving, they can always CC every instructor so that everyone is involved in the conversation. During the time of co-teaching, we also have weekly check-ins. This is where we discuss students' progress, any concerns that might have come up in the classroom or with our students, whether it be illness or personal challenges that they're experiencing. It gives us a chance to discuss each student and how we may be able to help them and support them during their time of need. We're also able to, to discuss upcoming events during this time where if faculty has personal um, obligations, like for instance, I co-taught with a faculty whose daughter was having a baby, and she would be away for a few days. I knew during her absence, I would need to be more involved in the classroom and took up that slack for her. Those opportunities do not exist as easily when we are not co-teaching. And then finally, it also gave us an opportunity opportunity to share our resources and to help faculty, I'm sorry, adjunct faculty become more involved outside of the classroom. They are more aware of what's going on in the department and with the school and have an opportunity to participate. Some of the challenges that we found in using the co-teaching model is that 
uh, we receive professional peer feedback and processing. Uh, sometimes we can look at the feedback we receive from each other, whether uh, someone's grading needs to be advanced in some way, or if our discussions are not as detailed as they may be. We can then receive feedback from other faculty who are working with us to support us during this process. Also, it helps us to look at students in a way where they may be challenged by the idea of a lead faculty and support faculty. We then have that opportunity to create this environment of collaboration so they understand the process of co-teaching. So then it allows us to help students to then see the co-teachers as equals. And then finally, communication with students in co-teaching is, is very important. It's important for them to understand that at some times their papers may be graded by one person and at another time it may be graded by another faculty. Therefore, making sure that communication between all parties is ongoing. It's important for them to make sure that when they're communicating about their challenges, they CC or make sure that each faculty member receives some information. And then I'd like to introduce Kirby again, who will talk about the student perspective of co-teaching. Kirby? Yes. Yeah. So the co-teaching model, as a student, we found very beneficial. We felt if we had a question or concern, we would always receive a response from either professor. Um, this teaching technique allowed us to truly use formats like our general discussion board, um, because we knew that we'd get an answer um, within a few hours um, from, again, from either professor. So we really felt as if um, we were supported. Um, we also, again, as Dr. Hudson mentioned, we see different perspectives on our papers, on our posts, each week as professors alternated week. Um, both professors became familiar with our work. Um, therefore, they could probably, properly excuse me, review our work and provide appropriate and supportive feedback. And we welcomed both. Um, as Dr. Hudson said, one professor may um, be stronger in a certain um, aspect than the other, no matter our paper in the end came out stronger. Um, it, it, it displayed a great aspect of our knowledge, our growth, and our professionalism, and we benefited greatly from both perspectives. And lastly, this model, this co-teaching model, um, it showed a great example of collaborative work. This is for students our first-hand experience kind of indirectly on how professionals work together to create something and to nurture, um, you know, the next generation, I guess you can say. Dr. Hudson. Okay. Thank you, Kirby. Next, I'd like to talk to you about faculty mentoring. As one of the newer members of the faculty and the clinical mental health program, I've had the opportunity to participate in faculty mentoring on a weekly basis with Dr. Soli, as well as with other adjuncts. And this has been an invaluable experience as we as faculty learn to navigate the courses, understand our roles and responsibilities. Having the weekly meeting allows us to be supported as well as connecting with um, each other, the faculty and the adjunct. We learn from each other and we grow together. Our weekly meetings were supportive in ways that helped us to develop our uh, grading as well as our uh, discussions in the classroom. It provided an opportunity to us for us to share challenges as well as some of the strengths that we found in our methods. And finally, I'll talk to you about the onboarding manual. Dr. Stretch had a vision that since new faculty would be coming into the department, it would be nice to have one of the newer members to begin the process of an onboarding manual for all faculty that would come, that would follow. First of all, this document is a live document and changes can occur at any time. As newer faculty come on board and find ways of uh, creating um, different environments or ways of helping the students, they can add to the document. In this document, we have an increased understanding of our roles and responsibilities. Those things are highlighted for us, as well as opportunities to, to oversee some of the other responsibilities in the department and topics. So for instance, earlier Dr. Elrich talked about the advising. We have, very, we have many templates that go along with our advising system. 
in the onboarding manual, new faculty can link to these templates to better understand the process, to understand exactly what they're to say and to do with students, as well as to contact Dr. Elridge directly if they have any questions or concerns. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kirby, who will discuss her spotlight moment. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. First, I'm going to just touch upon town hall meetings. Um, in the town hall meetings um, are a platform that truly creates a culture of community among the entire MHC program um, with faculty, staff, and students. Um, these meetings provide great insight into our, our program, um, really getting the opportunity to see faculty, staff, and other students and other cohorts um, face to face, hear their voices, hear their passion, and hear the love that they have for this program and for the profession. Um, it's a truly extraordinary time for all of us to come together. Town hall meetings typically occur once a term, and our terms are seven weeks long, um, and town hall meetings occur typically within the third week of each term. Uh, for example, um, spring one, um, which was our town hall meeting occurred January 28, 2016, and that spoke about our student success. Fall two, our town hall meeting occurred November 19, 2015, and that spoke about trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, um, TFGDT. Um, and then fall one, our town hall meeting occurred September 14, 2015, and we spoke about um, lessons learned from a student's perspective. So we discussed really an array of topics with um, different presenters, and they alternate between a student panel and clinical topics amongst our, our faculty and staff. Um, so again, just going back to the terms I gave you an example of, spring one, we spoke about student success. This was led by a student panel. This panel offered advice, encouragement, and answered any questions that any of the new students had. Uh, I was a part of that panel, and I offered advice on student tips and ways to find a balance or manage schoolwork and life, which my advice was just sitting down and really analyzing your schedule, seeing where you could really sit down and take the time to study, read your work, read the articles, and put forth the correct effort um, so that you can be successful. Um, fall 2, which occurred again in November 2015, Dr. Hudson spoke about um, TSCBT. She gave a great summary of this therapy, resources, and a website in which we could participate in online learning modules and even earn um, continuing education credit. Um, and again, in Fall 1, which occurred September 2015, this was lessons learned. Um, and this is also a student-led panel. So we just try to give uh, a voice to everyone within the program. Everyone has an opportunity to be a part of our town hall meetings um, as a participant or as a panelist um, or as just the main, main attraction. Um, and again, having the opportunity to hear the professors, faculty, and students hearing their passion towards what they're learning and the topic just continues to bond us and create a stronger community. Um, we really provide some great quick tips and helpful hints regarding the courses in the counseling community. Which then I'll go into my, my student highlight, as Dr. Hudson said. Um, and Dr. Hudson spoke about, you know, faculty supporting students. And for me, I can speak how this aspect is not only true, but a major component to our program. Um, my husband was in a major car accident in January 2015, and it completely totaled his car, left him out of work for three months. Um, in injuries, which he still has to this year, which is a whole year later. Um, and I was taking actually two classes, and one was with Dr. Soli. And when the accident occurred, I informed Dr. Soli almost immediately, um, sending her pictures of us in the ER. <laughs> and she remained in constant communication with me throughout the entire time. Um, I sent her updates, pictures to his recovery, my family, my coursework, just always communicating with her. Um, I completed the course. Unfortunately, it was at a grade that was not really satisfactory with the Chicago School Standards, but Dr. Philly was again by my side helping me fight to remain in the program. Um, and I thank her and I'm sure the other faculty that supported her in this process um, as it was new for both of us. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for everyone and their belief in me and, and their support and helping my family you know, recover in a way where I wasn't overwhelmed, they weren't overwhelmed, 
and we all kind of came out wonderful. Everyone's well, healthy, and we're progressing on just, just fine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hudson and Kirby. Next, we will be moving to room four uh, for collaboration efforts. And at this moment, I would like to introduce to you Melissa Seitz, Spring 2015 Cohort and Student Ambassador. Melissa? Thank you, Edward. Hello, everybody. Um, again, my name is Melissa Seitz. I am currently enrolled in the Spring 2015 Cohort. I am also one of the student ambassadors for the program. Myself and Dr. Lorianne Stretch, we will be talking about orientation in the Student Ambassador Program. Um, as one of my jobs as the Student Ambassador was to help with the orientation. After I did the orientation, I approached Dr. Stretch and expressed that the orientation should be more welcoming to the incoming students. I felt that orientation should excite the incoming students and give them more insight from the students who are in the program. The orientation has has students talking about their experience at residency and along with the program giving comfort to the incoming students. The orientation goes into detail about the culture of the program and highlights many aspects of the program and the culture that we learn of in the program. One of the things that was extremely remarkable about our orientation was the list of individuals who participated in it. So Melissa, can you go to the next slide so we can see that list? Um, I just think it really speaks to the collaboration of our program um, because it was truly a joint effort of faculty, staff, and students. And there were many people not on this list who also contributed um, from the course development uh, department. And um, Christy also contributed. Christy Eldridge also contributed content as well. I mean, it was just this to me is the epitome of who we are as a program in capturing what we do when we work together and the power that can happen when a community works together. And now this is a required component for our first course. All of our students have to watch this orientation and there's actually a little mini quiz that they take on during their first course to make sure that they've captured and understood who we are as CMHC. And it also captures all of the 2016 KCREP standards for, that are required for an orientation session as well. And we're happy to share the link to that for anybody who's interested as well. And so Melissa, I'll let you go ahead and talk about student ambassadors. Yes. Student ambassadors. Um, as one of the student ambassadors, I find it very important to give peer-to-peer -peer mentoring to students who need it. Students will reach out to me or the other student ambassadors for guidance on various subjects, such as how to stay on track with their assignments, stress and time management, and how to build a Prezi. Communicating with the other student ambassadors and or myself, we are able to give the students pointers on what we do to stay on track through a Prezi, or if we needed, we will talk to them one-on-one -on -one with the students to help them develop their own student plan for success. During class um, CM 521, Life Development, Lifespan Development, excuse me, the students are asked to develop a Prezi. For, for some, developing a Prezi can be very stressful. Others have never heard of a Prezi, let alone try to construct one so they can find it a little bit of intimidating. To assist the students during this class, the student ambassadors will offer a go-to meeting and share their screens on how, to, on how to develop a Prezi. We will either meet one-on-one -on -one with the individual, individual groups to give them guidance or as a whole class. In all classes, we have to work with TK20. Some find this very confusing and, again, have never worked with it before. We, the student ambassadors, develop a Prezi to demonstrate how to submit and recall an assignment with the TK220. As Thank my you. Student, okay. No, go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I'll go with my student highlight. OK. Um, mm -hmm. My student highlight um, was after taking the class CM 550, Diversity and Multiculture. It inspired me to dig more deeply into my culture background. For the holiday break, my parents gifted me a trip to Europe so I can learn and experience what it's like to be Jewish and to have a deeper understanding of the history and the culture of Jewish people. Not only was I learning about my own culture, I was learning about the cultures of the places I was visiting. The food, the language, and the history of these towns were very enriching. 
I was, I was glad to be given the opportunity to learn more about my culture and the other cultures of the countries I was visiting. It's an experience that will last me a lifetime. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa. Edward, I'll let you take it from here to guide us and now I'll monitor the question. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Stretch. So at this moment, we uh, are uh, having a question and answer session. So if you have any questions uh, regarding our presentation or have any questions for any uh, uh, students here, please uh, make sure to uh, put those questions in the question box, or I believe you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you for that. Dr. McGrath. I think you are unmuted. Let's see. You should be unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. I don't have a question for you, but I really want to thank you for such a wonderful presentation. It's so informative. Um, I must say, as a team, we did a really smooth job. I can think of many things that we would like to see you train us on. Um, you're a really good example for, for a number of our online departments, and I know uh, that a number of people were very excited to hear your presentation and see uh, that I think the pace and the tone that you're setting for counseling in an online environment. This is really wonderful and very exciting. Thank you, Dr. McBeth. And we will, we do have a recording of this, and we will be sharing this with everybody who is here, and we encourage you to share it with others that you think would be interested in it. Um, we're definitely going to be sharing this with admissions um, and our student advising team as well. So, and other, a few others have asked for the recording as well. Maria, let me... Hey, Maria, you should be able to talk now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for this amazing presentation. I am so impressed what you're doing in your program. And um, I, I mean, wow. Especially the, um, the student involvement that you've been able to integrate into all of this planning. I am just so impressed. And so I'm not actually in your program. I served as a GA under Lori mm -hmm. Soli. And it was a really amazing experience for me, which is why I've tried to follow your program. And I'm wondering, as a student outside of your program, is it, are there any ways that we could get involved to support you or to support your programming? Um, I just, I find your work really exciting. And I think that as a future professor, I can really learn from you. Maria, we would love to have you back in any way, shape, or form, so do not hesitate to reach out to us. <laughs> love it. Yes. I'm sure Dr. Soli would love to hear from you, so just reach out to any one of us. We'd be happy okay. to see which way. Um, I mentioned this to Dr. Stevenson, but I just mentioned it to the group as well. Um, many of the things you heard about tonight we're actually writing articles on, and some of those articles are actually being co-written with students as well. Uh, wow. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, you know, to have those opportunities, um, like uh, Jasara Glover was one of the names that was mentioned. She's helped, uh, been very um, supportive as a student ambassador and student, and she's actually going to be co-authoring an article with a couple of us as well on some of the work that we're doing. So the students really, this is their program, and I hope you heard that because we're so proud that it's their program and they can really own it and feel like they really help make this to what it is. Um, yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, Dr. Soley, um, James Val has asked, could you elaborate more on the students' use of TK20 program? I don't know if you or if you want one of the students to answer that, but I'll turn that question over to you. Sure, I would be, I would be happy to. And as of now, because it is just a pilot, the students haven't had a lot of interaction with it. Um, the one of the, actually probably next week, uh, the students will be receiving, actually their field work application will be run through TK20, so um, there's an application that they will um, fill out that will give 
information um, about the student um, and then it is saved in an application. I'm able to view it through TK20, make notes on it. They actually will upload their resume. Um, they're uploading a, um, a qualitative um, introduction to themselves. One of the cool things is that once that is um, I can actually send that link of TK20 out to prospective field work supervisors who might want to um, who might want to view the uh, the applications. This is particularly helpful for us as an online program because we do deal with site partners quite literally nationwide um, and actually worldwide, um, given that we do have international students as well. So that's one of the ways the students will also be um, in the clinical training forum that we have created. Um, students and actually site supervisors are likely enrolled um, in that and be able to um, conduct trainings in there. Within the, the clinical training forum, the students will be um, completing some of their, again, some of their free work for their um, their field work, including um, another, another, um, another application. And it's how it's how all of the data will be um, will be gathered um, as they begin their field work, and then that also these binders will roll out as well as they move into their individual classes throughout the field work process. So, as I said, it's very it's very much in the initial stages of development, but uh, we're we're hopeful that the the work that um, everyone is doing will will be um, will be interesting, and at some point in time, we'll be definitely sharing that out. Uh, Dawn has been um, quite involved in helping us uh, launch this process as well. So. Thank you, Dr. Foley. That's what I can tell you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Or the students are happy to answer questions as well, so don't hesitate to reach out and ask them about their experiences. They're a great group. Uh, we're so fortunate to have the students we have and so appreciative of their time tonight and their time preparing for this because we know they're very busy with their challenging in classes, so they've really shown a commitment. And I do, um, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, I'd like to call out Melissa. She actually put together our Prezi tonight and has been working with coordinating like us as if we were a herd of cats all over the place and making sure that we all got our information into her and that she could format it and get it posted in the format that was presentable. So I do want to acknowledge Melissa for the outstanding work she did um, with this. Any other questions? And yes, James, we will be sharing the recording of this with everybody who attended and then I have a list of other people who have asked for the recording as well. So I'll be sending that out. Any other questions before we finish up? I guess I would just like to, this is Dr. Soli, I would also like to publicly acknowledge uh, Dr. Lorian Stretch. Um, truly, she acknowledges all of us on a regular basis. However, without her amazing leadership and guidance, our program would not have all of the innovations that it did, that it does. We would not have the ability to be able to create what we are creating and co-creating and continuing to create. And so I feel insanely grateful for the opportunity to be able to work with her, to have her as a mentor. And I just cannot say enough about how lucky I think that we are as a program to, to have her leadership. So um, thank you. Dr. Stretch for all of that you do to make this program what it is. Thank you, Dr. Soli. I agree. Thank you. Edward, did you have any closing remarks? No, just uh, a wonderful thank you to uh, all of our uh, uh, professors and, and student presenters. I mean, this program has has definitely changed my life and I think that you can tell by all of our student highlights uh, that uh, it is a wonderful effect on all of us so thank you Dr. Stretch and 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 Dr. Eldridge and Dr. Soli and Dr. Hudson for your continued commitment to our counselor education and uh, we'll it's 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 something that I'll never forget so thank you thank you guys
Okay, well, I thank you all for your attendance. I really appreciate it, uh, Dr. Stevens and Dr. McGrath and all the other leadership that have attended tonight. I know that this is a big chunk of your time, and I'm just deeply appreciative that we could share all of these wonderful things that we're doing at CMHC. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Well done.